Church 
I didn't turn on my mic. Oh my goodness. Um, I was taking a walk the other day and near Brushy Tree Creek. Any of you ever gone out there to hike those trails? It's a beautiful trail and they've got this great big, big trail, but I like to get off on the little trails, on the side trails where it's right next to the creek. And I was traveling down the pathways and um, I noticed a lot of bikers were going by. And when you do that, you kind of have to get off the trail a little bit so they can go by because it's very, very narrow. And, and you know, like that happens once or twice, you know, it's not a big deal. But as I was hiking on this, this day kept happening over and over and over again. And I was like, what's the deal? Why are there so many bikers? I'm like, oh my goodness, it's Labor Day. Everybody has the day off. And, and I was like, oh, well, now I have to like keep getting off and they just keep zipping by and they don't even say thank you or like hello or good morning or anything. And so I'm like going, and funny thing was, is when I started this walk, I was like, I better keep an eye open for snakes, you know, because they could be out here. And, and, and now I'm like, oh, well, I'm not going to see any snakes. And I'm like, well, which one is it, Chris? And do you want to see them or do you not want to see them? <laughs> Make up my mind because I, but I knew I wouldn't see any because they were clearing off the trail. And, and so I'm kind of like going rouse, 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 around about all of these different bikers and not caring about my pedestrian hood. And, and um, oh, woe is me. And then I come upon this couple. And this couple has a puppy dog. And they were so sweet and so kind that they moved off the trail for me. And they moved their little puppy dog off the trail. And we like looked at each other and we said, good morning. And there was this little love exchange there. And I, and I went on and I was like, oh, life is good. <laughs> life is really good. And this is a beautiful trail and it's a great day. And I'm so glad everybody's out here and enjoying it. And suddenly I'm like in a whole new zone in my head. And it got me to thinking about what kind of energetic footprint do I leave behind me? And I'm wondering about what kind of energetic footprint I left with all those bikers. <laughs> and how can I craft inside my heart and my mind as I walk, as I walk this journey of life, a higher order of being? So that when I meet people like these beautiful people, that I leave a smile in their heart once I'm done connecting with them. So that when you're burying me, love, you think a good thing about me. <laughs> a good thing. Yay. Yeah. Let's hope that's not anytime soon. But <laughs> um, <laughs> I was wondering about this higher order of being. And is there actually... 
actually an order to our being? And if there is an order to our being, what is that and how do we navigate it? How do we move from one level to another? And then like, how could we practice that? So that's what I'd hope to, it felt spirit nudging me to bring here to us this morning. So let's explore, is there an order to our being? This is a probable, possible order. This is the chakras, the, the very base chakra going up. Each one, that green one is the heart chakra, throat, crown, the ultimate top of our head. And there are seven in our energy field. This was designed by um, yogis in India over 4,000 years ago. And basically what it says is that there is an energy system in our body that's a little more subtle than our own nervous system. When I looked up a definition for the chakra system, um, it said that it is a network uh, like these are converging centers, the mediators for all of the energy within our body, whether it be spiritual, mental, emotional, or physical, that they all kind of coalesce and they organize in these centers within our body. Now, it's not just the Indian culture that has this faith and belief and uh, theology. It is also Buddhist. It's um, the mystical branch of Judaism. It was found in ancient I Egypt, the Mayan culture, and several of our Native American cultures all have this kind of belief system of this order within our physical beings. Now, I'm really kind of curious about who may be familiar with the chakra systems. This is just a survey. Okay, first of all, it's new to me. Raise your hand if it's new to me. Okay, good, great. And if you have some awareness of the chakra systems, I've been exposed to it before. And like, if you feel like I'm really pretty knowledgeable about this, Okay, guys, wow, you're, you're fantastic. That helps me to kind of know as a speaker, like where are we at as, as a whole? Well, the chakra system was interesting as a probable or possible order from a theological standpoint. Um, and then I also read as I was learning that Maslow's hierarchy of needs from the Western psychological perspective is correlated to this order within our body. Maslow built this pyramid of needs saying that we have at the very base of that a need for a, a physiological well-being. In other words, you take oxygen away from me right now and I'm not going to be well. <laughs> I'm going to like be fighting for breath. And so we have to have this very base level of needs met before we can climb up to that next level of needs, which would be the safety need. You know, if someone threatened my well-being, you know, I would probably not be able to stand here and function in the fashion in which I would hope to function right now. So we have to feel safe in our environment. And once we have our physiological and our safety needs met, then we can move up to the feeling of being belonging and loving and being connected to one another. And we meet that need and then we climb up to the next one, which is a feeling of esteem and, and um, a feeling of connection to our greater world and the capacity to shine forth our light. And then we climb up to that top level, which is our self-actualization, which is the, the, the embodiment of everything we are capable of being. And if, if we had to like put Jesus Christ into this actualization table, he would be at that level of that highest order of being where he expressed the full nature of his soul and his spirit. And, you know, I know that all of us, none of these are wrong. Nothing is bad here. I mean, I, this is all part of who we are. And if we happen to be on a very basic need, if we're hangry, we need to go and get some food and, um, and, and restore our physicality so that we can think once again and participate in life. There's another teacher that proposes a possibility of an order of our being. This comes from Dr. David Hawkins. And Dr. David Hawkins was a psychologist. He wrote many books. He actually climbed this ladder, which is, a, it, I, I don't know if climb is the right word, surrender. Surrender probably would be a better word because what we actually have to do is counterintuitive is not the mind can't climb it. It's, it's a letting go process that allows the true nature of our being to shine through. So on the lower levels of consciousness, this is a map of consciousness that is, is shame and guilt and apathy at a very 
basic level of being. And then grief, fear, desire moves up. Each of these levels is a higher vibrational energy and consciousness than the one below it. None of them are wrong. It's just a part of where we can be in consciousness. Every step we move up into courage is the level of, of um, integrity. When we can step into courage, then we are actually operating in a new order of being and we move out of the world of force, trying to make things happen and move into a level of power, which is more divinely inspired and divinely guided and directed. And so everything that moves up from there, neutral, uh, neutrality, willingness, acceptance, you feel the lightning uh, element, the, the empowerment of our being until we get to the level of reasoning and love. And then we get to unconditional love and joy, peace, and ultimately enlightenment. Every step we move up this ladder of consciousness, this, this, this map of consciousness is exponentially more powerful. So the love thoughts that we have are more powerful than any of the thoughts that are less than that in a day. And they can actually counterbalance those thoughts. Just knowing this, if we were done right now, there would be benefit in understanding the order of being and the fact that we have a body and that there are different levels of needs within our body and that we as a human being expressing in the world have the capacity to elevate our awareness or to create and establish a higher order of being within ourselves. So is there an order of being? Maybe, maybe there is, and maybe we actually participate in it. So, what do we do and how do we navigate that? How do we actually work with this now that we have this knowledge? Well, um, if most of us here are probably still in a brain that uses the amygdala, and the amygdala is a portion of our brain that senses danger. And so if I did see a snake right here, <laughs> I might just have amygdala hijack, which basically is where that, that snake goes, whoa, danger, you need to do something to get yourself out of the situation. Now, is that bad? No, no, of course not. If there was happening and I had a cobra or something that was threatening my, I would need to focus my attention and get out of the situation so that I would no longer be threatened. Now, what happens when the amygdala gets triggered, which happens in most of us at times, is that there is a chemical bath of 1,400 chemicals that are streaming out of our bodies, giving us the ability to fight, flight, freeze, or flee. I think a flea and flight are probably the same, but you get the idea. Um, so basically, we are being given, our body is responding with a, giving us the capacity to focus our attention and to get out of danger, which is extremely helpful. And it happens for like a minute and a half to two minutes. Now, that chemical cocktail of... of um, the amygdala's reaction is going to happen when you have a trigger of your amygdala. So don't expect that you're going to probably be able to think right away or that you're not going to be in the prefrontal cortex solving the world's problems in that time. It's just a physiological reaction. Now, after that minute and a half or two minutes, if we stay in a state of alarm, if we stay in a state of reaction, that's our choice. That because after that chemical reaction happens, we are able to begin thinking again. So if your partner gets upset and they're going through that, give them two minutes, give them two <laughs> minutes. After that two minutes, then, then we can get to start to breathe and be again. Now, this is how we navigate that amygdal, amygdal, um, amygdala hijack. How do we navigate that? We breathe. We consciously breathe. You see, our conscious brain, the only thing it can actually work with in the autonomic nervous system of our body is the breath. So you have an amygdala hijack, you take a breath. After, as soon as you can, just take a breath and breathe it out. That deep breath will take a signal to your brain that says, ah, oh, everything's okay. The shallow breath is not needed anymore. I can now begin to relax. Everything's gonna be all right. You could even think that, I am safe. I am secure. I love and approve of myself. Everything is going to be okay. And any of those thoughts, anything that you want to bring with your breath. You know, ironically, 
the breath is, um, it, it comes, the word psyche comes from the Greek word um, that actually means life, it means spirit, and it means consciousness. So that actually comes from a verb that means to cool or to blow. So the very word psyche comes from this word to cool or to blow, which means our breath. So our breathing, our very breathing is of our spirit and it connects us to a higher mind. So when we are triggered, we can use consciously the breath to center us again. So we breathe. (sighs) Everything is all right. Everything's going to be okay. Now, when you're really fully developed in a consciousness level like Jesus Christ, you don't have an amygdala hijack. That's where the higher levels of consciousness really start to kick in. And when he was being crucified, he wasn't up there breathing and (laughs) thinking, you know, I, I gotta get out of this chemical reaction. He was thinking, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So he was in a whole different mindset. And most often we are in a thinking mindset, a mindset where we can actually make choices. And you know how there's that global positioning system that helps our cars, how to navigate our cars and how to get around in the world? Well, we were equipped at birth with an IGS system, an internal guiding system. It's called our intuition. And that intuition will lead us and guide us day by day, step by step, as we make choices in this world. And it operates a lot like that childhood game, hot, cold. Say we hid something way back there and I was trying to find it and you guys all hid it while I was out of the room and and like I'm walking over here and you're saying, oh, nope, nope, you're getting colder, you're getting colder. And then I go a little bit over here and you go, oh, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer. That's like our intuition inside our souls, inside our hearts, when we say or do something that takes us out of the higher good, the higher order of life, when I'm not kind, when I'm not kind to bikers, I wasn't really mean, but I wasn't like smiling at them. Um, it, it, It leads me away from my good. It's leading me in the colder zone where I'm gonna be more unhappy and I'm gonna feel shame and grief and guilt and all of those other things. But when I choose love, when I choose a higher emotion like gratitude, when I choose an uh, opportunity to be kind, even if it's just to smile at you and to feel that in my heart, then, then I'm choosing to warm, walk in the warm direction, to walk in the direction that gives me life and gives me hope and gives me faith. And it elevates everyone around me. And that leaves a happier footprint in in my journey. So how can we navigate? Well, if we're immediately hijacked, we breathe. You can speak, it's okay. (laughs) And then if, if we're just navigating, we pay attention to our internal guidance system, which says, nope, too cold, warm. Yes, that's the direction. All right, so... How do we really change our level of consciousness, our order of being? And how, if we want to be up there in those states of unconditional love, how do we get there? How do we get there if we're not there? Well, Dr. Joe from um, uh, Becoming Supernatural writes this quote. You just can't will it or force it to happen. You can't do it by trying or hoping and and wishing because you can't do it with your conscious mind. You can't, you have to get into your subconscious mind because that's where the operating system is. That's where the projector of our reality comes from. It's the autonomic autonomic nervous system that functions and controls these centers, the centers of our body. You have to get out of your beta brain wave pattern, which is our normal consciousness, because beta keeps you in your conscious mind separated from your subconscious or your autonomic nervous system that actually is running the show. Okay, that sounds like bad news, doesn't it? This is from Dr. Joe. Um, It's not bad news. It's just giving us a pointer into the right direction. 
Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of the Unity Movement, would completely agree, agree with Dr. Joe. You see, what he would have said is that we have our conscious mind, say that's everything that I see out here, and then we have the divine mind of God, say that's every possible thought that I could be thinking, every good thing, every wonderful thing. That's the divine mind or the super conscious mind. And what stands between that divine mind of God and my conscious mind is my subconscious. It's all the programming, all the belief, all the past experiences, all of the assumptions, the opinions, the, the justifications, everything that I have lodged within this subconscious mind becomes part of the projector of my life. As if there were a light of God shining through that subconscious, and then I see on the, on the, the screen of my existence what is shining through my subconscious. Now, if I want to change that, I've got to take that slide out and put a new one in. Is everyone old enough to know what a projector was? Who's here? <laughs> if you're very young, ask your parents. They'll tell you. It, it, it was like this old-fashioned thing that you kind of got stuck in there. And you had to pull them out. And it was, it was interesting. But we, this whole system helps us understand that, oh, our projector is our subconscious mind, and we have to clean that out for us to actually elevate in our higher order of being. Now, when I was getting this talk ready, I, I said, honey, so how do you do it? How do you gain a higher level of consciousness? And my husband said, well, it's the spiritual fab four, of course. And I'm like, yeah, that's your way of saying it. I just want to find another way of being in this truth and bringing this to life to where it really makes sense to us. But then I got to thinking about it. The spiritual fab four is humility, surrender, humility, and surrender. I was thinking about that. I'm like, well, what else does this conscious mind have to do but be humble enough to know that its projections are not as clear as what they could be and to be humble enough to surrender them? And then the third one is devotion, to take time to, to devote part of my existence to something higher. And the fourth one is contemplative practices, to devote time to truth, to devote time to prayer, to devote some of my time to meditation so that I can get into the higher vibration of the divine mind, that it can clean out my subconscious mind and reorient me to a higher order of being. This last week was the um, prayer vigil for the 24-hour prayers for the World Day of Prayer. It was amazing. There's something about that when people come together in a higher order of being, it builds over time. And I felt connected to everyone who had been a part of that. And actually, after we'd been in there an hour, I felt this sense of, of joy and freedom. And I was connected to my heart. And, and I'm like, I feel like I'm on vacation. I feel like the freedom and the joy that I feel on vacation. I was walking through the halls of our of our our offices with that same level of freedom. If we knew that this devotional practice of contemplating truth would bring us to a state of a mini vacation, would we do it? Every day? I would. I invite you to consider that, to consider the freedom of that and the joy of that and the, and the liberation of that. Which brings us to our third point. There, there's an order of being and we can practice it. And now, how do we practice it? How do we begin to establish a higher order of being? I want to share with you a prayer that we did. Oh, I brought it up there. Couldn't remember what I did with it. This is the Bible, by the way. But I also have a prayer in here. And this prayer comes from Dr. David Hawkins. And he actually shared it in a... Um, uh, sermon that he was, or a speech that he was sharing. I'm going to abbreviate it for you. And this is what we led into those 30-minute prayer segments with during the World Day of Prayer. And we'll have a little silence in the middle of that, and then we'll bring you back out with words again thereafter, okay? So I invite you to gift yourself with the gift of this moment. See it as a little mini vacation, if you would, and allow yourself to maybe sit with your spine straight so that you can breathe a little more deeply. And if there's any place that feels tension or pain, just bring your attention to that place within your body and bless it with great love, great compassion. 
allowing ourselves to become still into this silent sanctuary of our souls and our center in the space where God, the infinite, is seated within. And we listen to this words. That which is the voice of God is silence. That we sink into the voice of God, we sink into the silence, which is divine presence. Behind the thought, behind the thinkingness, is the infinite silence. And the infinite silence is the source of all existence. And beneath the thoughts is the profound silence. And all we have to do is to become aware of that silence by realizing it is there. In the middle of cacophony and catastrophe, there is nothing but the infinite silence. So you can identify with that silence and just maintain awareness. You can go about your daily life and do everything that you need to do and at all times still be aware of the presence of the silence. So that gives you a centering a centering kind of prayerfulness is you're always aware of divine presence, which is the infinite context. And the reality of the presence of God is an infinite silence. And then that which you hold in mind in that silence tends to manifest not as a result of causation, but of potentiality manifesting. And we thank Thee, O Lord, for Thy divine presence as the infinite silence out of which arises our existence. And so it is. Amen. So is there a higher order of being? I believe so. We can navigate it by practicing our practices. And I want to close our time here today with a scripture, which I believe is speaking to us all about this very practice. It's from Ephesians verse, or chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and then continuing on 15 through 16. And it's titled, Unity in the Body of Christ. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, this is cited to Paul, and he's writing from prison, I therefore beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is only one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. May we this week establish a higher order of being within and all around you. The light of God within me honors and respects and honors the light of God within you. Namaste. 
Thanks for joining us today. And if you like the message, we invite you to like it, share it, and please subscribe. We are a new thought church where lives are transformed. So come on, check us out at unityhills.org. Namaste. Namaste.